Alright guys, Bill, I'm here back with a new video, and in this video, we're back with another kind of big survivor ranking, and I typically do these at the beginning of every year, and this one's a little bit late, but still be doing it, where I've obviously done in the past, survivor winner rankings, season rankings, runner-up rankings, final juror rankings, merge boot rankings, first boot rankings, and I guess now we're at the point where I'm doing penultimate juror rankings, I guess. So this will be a ranking of the second to last juror on every season. Now again, it would have been nice if we kept the solid format that allowed me to just say fourth or fifth placers, but whatever. Essentially, this would be the people that placed in fourth on final two seasons and people that placed in fifth and final three seasons. Now this will be a ranking of how I feel like they played on those specific seasons. So with that, let's start off at number 45. We're going to a player that is the only player on this list that was voted out and came back into the game. And that person is Andrea from Redemption island and again i think andrea played a very messy game on that season where even before she was voted out i do feel like she was kind of just a tag along in the majority alliance very clearly on the bottom of it through her relationship with matt that kind of ostracized her a bit and then just continued to enable a power structure that really was not beneficial to her until she was eventually just taken out at the first opportunity there only then come back into the game and then proceed to be voted out again for i mean like straight up if she had not been voted out to get to the final five she would probably be higher on this list probably even like 10 to 15 spots higher on this list but again as is i do feel like her game was already not particularly great but then she gets voted out and comes back to the game to where mixing on the fact that again she had no inequity at the end i do feel like she's someone that i'm not looking particularly highly at so for me she's here at number 45 now number 40 Four, we're moving on to a player that I think was largely clueless in the game. I think this is a person that didn't know what was going on for the majority of their season and kind of was just on the bottom of the game the entire time. And that person is Colby from Heroes vs. Villains. And again, this is not an assessment of Colby as a player in the grand scheme of things, simply his Heroes vs. Villains game, which is really bad. Again, he's literally on the bottom from the very beginning, barely scraping on by on the Heroes tribe. Again, surviving over his allies and Stephanie and Tom, who had bigger targets on their back after that, he's able to survive over James simply because James got injured and then was on the bottom of that tribe coming into the merge though again they just so happen to win the last few immunity challenges to where once they get to the merge he's once again on the bottom after the merge vote while he does again get all the way to final five he really had no true path to the very end unless he had one out there and, and even if he went out like does he win maybe again he obviously probably has the heroes votes but it's not even necessarily a guarantee that he would win that to where again like I just feel like Colby's game is mostly pretty bad here again it's one where he's really just on the bottom the entire time very rarely gets anything truly done in the game again even the times that he does were things like the serene move where again he was kind of just a tag along in that and then something like voting out Candace which I mean that was just a more self-preservation move more so than one that like benefited his position in the game and like really I just feel like his game is not particularly good so because that for me he's here number 44 and number 43 we're keeping these players that had very little agency in their games so this one at least was in the majority for a little bit and that person is Dan Lembo from Survivor Nicaragua and again Dan Lembo I feel like was just kind of there for a lot of the season he was kind of just on the bottom not being targeted because he's Dan Lembo though to be fair it did seem like Dan at least was a massive jury threat at the end where there's talk about how he would have won if he got into the end but even that i don't know if i fully fully believe as again like are people really gonna vote for dan lembo but again you never know but, but again in comparison to someone like a colby i think he was in the majority for more of the season again early on he was in the majority on the original espada tribe though to be fair i believe he actually was someone looked at as a potential first boot due to him being one of the weaker people on his tribe but again he still was like aligned with marty and marty was really running things he was once again like in marty's alliance in the post merge so again like he at least had some people that really wanted to work with him that made it somewhat deep into the game. Again, it's not really much, but again, I think it's like a sliver better than Colby to where for me, he's here at number 43. Now 42, essentially Dan Lembo, but a little bit better. And that person is Butch from Survivor of the Amazon. And again, Butch was at least in the majority for more votes than Dan Lembo. I mean, Butch was in a pretty decent spot in the original Tambaki tribe where he was aligned with like Roger and... Dave, and again, he wasn't getting as much heat on him as Roger was, or again, had he gotten to his ideal final two against Roger, he does win, at least that's something, and again, they still maintain the numbers after the swap as well, though it's after the merge where his game goes a bit downhill, obviously, he's blindsided the Roger vote, is kind of just on the bottom being kept around just because he's 
Butch. But then he becomes a pretty integral number in the Alex Blind side, but again, it's simply because they needed him as a number, not because he did anything particularly well to get that. And then we get him at six, where he's even blindsided there, where Christy goes home, until he's eventually voted out at four, just as an expendable number there. Again, it's not a particularly good game, and it's not one where, like, I think he had that much of a chance of winning, unless he was at the end against Matthew. But again, I do think there's more points where he was in the majority, particularly the entire pre-merge phase of the game, to where... Yeah, it's enough to put him above Dan Lembo here at 42. Now, number 41, we're moving on to a player that I do find tough to assess because I do feel like the show didn't really do much to really portray this person's game. Though, based on what we've heard post-show, it doesn't sound particularly good, and that person is Boo from Survivor Fiji. And again, a lot of the things that we hear about Boo is about how Boo was a goat, and if he had gotten to the end, he couldn't win the game. But again, like based on the show, we don't really know why that's the case. He didn't really come off particularly poorly on the show. But again, like I mean, considering his really low win equity, that obviously is something that harms him on this list. But even beyond that, I mean, this game's not particularly good. I mean, it's one where he's kind of just there on his original tribe, and technically there alongside the majority, but it's a group that's never really fully tested, and once we get to the swap and the merge like obviously he becomes part of earl's alliance and works alongside the likes of dreams cassandra and Yao. though a major issue for me with boo is the fact that he is so clearly on the bottom of that and doesn't do anything to really change his fate in the game i mean to be fair there's people much further on this list that have the same issue or my issue with boo in particular is the fact that he was even further on the bottom of his group or at least they were on the bottom to the point where they were going to be picked off as a spot that again would have been a penultimate juror anyway boo is someone that even had to win challenges to get to that point anyway considering again just how little agency he seemed to actually have in his game and how he just kind of was there to be picked off eventually in the end game with no real winning chances either again for me i don't really feel there's that much to praise for his game and that's why he's here number 41 now number 40 moving on to another player i don't think there's that much to praise from this person either and that person is eric reichenbach from survivor caramoan and again purely based on his caramoan game but it's a really bad one i mean he's simply just there in the majority alliance again not really doing much actively not doing much he doesn't want to be involved in any strategy and he just simply doesn't do anything in the game and through that ends up burning jury votes along the way i don't think he's a particularly likely winner even if he had gotten to the end now again the thing to obviously prop him up is the fact that he got medevaced and had he not got medevaced again at least there's a chance he would have survived truth be told i mean unless he wins final five immunity i think he's to boot there anyway but again like he at least had a shot and like dude very i think you could argue maybe that's a reason why he should be much higher on the list but i do think that really just shows you how bad i feel like his game was to where again like he gets blindsided right away at the Francesca vote he attached to Brandon at the point where Brandon eventually goes home and he's really just again on the bottom of his group for really most of the season and just does nothing about it enables a power structure that is not beneficial to him while also again just having no real winning chances either to me it's a really bad game and he's here at number 40 now number 39 we're moving on to a player that I also don't feel like did much in the game however this is a person that at least would have won if they had gotten to the end and that person is Lydia from Survivor Guatemala and again, Lydia is someone that was a very known jury threat. Had she gotten to the end, I do think she probably wins pretty handily against most people in the end game. Again, I think against Danny, you can maybe qualm with it, but I do think she definitely wins against Stephanie and Ray. Probably wins against a lot of the people that were booed right before her. To where and Lydia was a big jury threat. The problem is, I feel like she did very little to actually earn that status, at least from a game front. Again, like obviously she was like well liked socially, and that's something that I at least give her credit for. But I, I do feel like in terms of her navigation through the game, she was just simply there. I mean, she didn't really do much. Kind of just let Rafe and Stephanie do a lot of the work and made a lot of decisions for the tribe to the point where Lydia again just is on the bottom of her group the entire time where like technically she was on the bottom of the power structure even at the time of the final six and would have been booted there if they didn't flip against Judd and again the fact that they end up booting Lydia over Danny is pretty insane there so I think that does show you again some failings in Lydia's game as well and also mixing that in the fact that again she was on the bottom for her tribe initially as well where she was a decoy target the first two times again like I don't feel like there's not much to praise really outside of her win equity here I don't feel like she really did much actively in the game. She was kind of just allowing herself to be on the bottom of a sizable power structure. So I don't think she played particularly well, and that's why she's here at number 39. At number 38, we're moving on to players that had a little bit more agency in the game, though we're still on the bottom despite that agency. And at 38, I do have PG from Survivor China. And PG is someone that I really want to put higher on this list. Again, PG is someone that was a very scrappy player, one that tried to make moves in the game. The problem is that she failed almost every time and really gotten almost nothing really done in the game now i will say she is 
in a pretty decent spot in the original Zon. Blue Tribe, again, she is towards the top of that power structure. Again, has a really good relationship with Jamie and Eric. Obviously, after the swap, she tries to make the big move and throwing the challenge, and she does get Aaron out from that, so at least there's that, but then obviously fails to get rid of James. To where she comes in and merge, down in numbers, loses even Frosty as a number, and really from that point on, again, she's just on the bottom, just barely scraping by, surviving through either, like, winning challenges or there's being bigger threats around where again she gets all the way to five but has no real path to the end outside of winning immunities and even then does she even win if she gets to the end i think that's a bit questionable as well the where again like i think pg's game is one that i really want to put higher just simply due to the fact that again she was trying she was trying to make these moves and trying to get out of her bad position but it was simply a bad position that she remained in until she eventually went out so i can't really praise her too highly because that for me she's here at number 38 at number 37 we're moving on to a player that i think is actually worth Worse than PG. However, I think this person was in the majority for longer than PG, and that person is Abby Maria from Philippines. And again, Abby Maria gets all the way to five in a position where she's taken out in a spot where she really shouldn't have been. Again, Scoop and Lisa should have taken her to the end, but I think it's an indictment on her. Mixing that with the fact that, and she was on the bottom after the artist vote, though, and to be fair, again, she was in the majority before that. Again, she was in the majority for the pretty much phase of the game, very well positioned, essentially being in the middle of her tribe at that point. Well, following that, at the merge again she's still in the majority as ten dang holds the numbers for a few rounds now again like once the game flips on her she's pretty much a dead man walking kind of being kept around just due to the fact that she's not really that big of a threat and even then again i think you could argue she goes home at seven if she didn't win immunity there she also again had no real chance of winning the game i don't think she wins the game against literally anybody on that season but while she can get votes i don't feel like it's really enough to ever win and even then it's not even guaranteed that she gets those votes so again i still think it's a pretty bad game but again considering the fact that she was in the majority for like pretty much the first two thirds of the game in comparison to PG, who is kind of only that for first, like, half, if that. I'm going to give the edge to Abby Maria here, so she's here at number 37. Now, number 36, we're moving on to a player that I just really struggled with where to put this person, this being a person that was a very scrappy player and navigated through the game in a really interesting way, though they were also not particularly well-liked on their cast and was kind of towards the bottom, and I don't think I had much win equity, and that person is Eliza from Survivor Vanuatu. And, again, Eliza is just someone that was, again, just kind of skating on by Again, she was never really truly involved in most groups. I mean, she does flip against Dolly, which earns her a lot of ire, only for her to be then on the outs during the Mia vote. She is just on the bottom of the power structure for that women group coming into the merge, to where even after the merge, she's looked at as someone that is pretty expendable, to where, again, by the time the final seven, again, the vote flips off of Chris to just take out Eliza because she's the easy target. And obviously, at that point, that's where we have Twilight and Scout make the move. But again, not because they liked Eliza, they actually hated Eliza, but simply needed her for number and at that point Eliza's kind of just dragged through the game kind of against her will not really even wanting to take out Amy at six and then also being blindsided by the Julie vote at five where she's eventually taken out of four again it's not a particularly good game it's one where again she's kind of in and out of the majority like many of the people we just talked about I think for me the reason why I have her a bit higher is because I do feel like there's a lot more scrappiness there I do feel like she at least tried towards the end of her game to get back on the same page which simply couldn't get Chris to go along with it though again a massive issue for me is just lack of win equity and that's kind of what leaves her here at number 36 now 35 so moving on to a player that i do very much struggle where to put this person considering the fact that i don't feel like they played particularly well on their season and was someone that was never really part of any true power structure on their season but was at least someone that had win equity maybe and that person is keith nail from survivor cambodia and again keith for me is someone that i do struggle with again assessing his win equity i don't know if he wins if he gets to the end i do think he probably loses if he's at the end against kelly or kimmy even at the end against spencer and Tasha, I do think it's a toss-up there to where while he's someone that is a very affable presence, again, I'm a bit unsure on his win equity. Beyond that, I do think his navigation through the game is not particularly strong. I mean, early on, I mean, he's not being targeted, but he's also not really that well positioned. To be fair, he doesn't have to go to tribal, so it's like it never is really tested, but then coming to the merge again, I feel like he instantly flips against his own group and takes out Cass at the merge, which is bad. He is again just kind of on the bottom of the power structure moving forward where he's simply not being taken out because he's not really a threat to anybody, but but he really is not really having much power in the game. And now, obviously, I will give him credit for being involved in the Stephen Fishback blind side. That's at least something. Also, the fact that he gets to a tie at the final six. So, had that tie worked out for him, again, there's at least a winning scenario for him. But realistically, like, I do think his game is just kind of poor. Where I think the people that he wanted to go to the end with were people that were just going to beat him. And even then, had very little agency throughout most of his game. And because that for me, he's here at number 35. Now, 34. Moving on to a player that was 
kind of in and out of the majority group at many points. So with someone that never really had much power in the game. And that person is Dr. Mike from Survivor HHH. And Dr. Mike is someone that early on, he was pretty much on the bottom of the original healers group. It did seem like he was definitely someone that would have been considered to go home had they gone the tribal. Yeah, despite that, he again, he sticks with the healers. And to be fair, he does build better relations with the healers along the way. And he seemed pretty close to the likes of Jessica and Cole. He obviously builds a relationship with Joe. And again, he does do good work in that sense to where coming into the merge again, he's not in that bad of a spot within the healers group. Though the problem is that the healers are on the bottom. And again, Dr. Mike is on the bottom for those next few rounds completely wastes an idol along the way and gets very benefited from the fact that other people are flipping the vote against JP. So obviously they take out JP only for him to then lose Joe. But then again, at the final seven, while again, he's on the bottom there, he's at least part of the flip against Ben, only for the idol play to come into play. And he's at least in the majority when voting out Ashley, only then being taken out at five, largely as an expendable number there. And to be fair, again, it's a very wonky situation where obviously Ben was the target. Ben's idol play causes Mike to go home there. Though at the same time, I do feel like the qualm that he had there is the fact that he is just so expendable. Where they obviously chose to keep Devin around over him. And it's also around where, again, he fails to make the optimal move for him. This way him recognizing what the optimal move is and putting a vote onto Devin. To where, I mean, like, straight up, I don't think Mike is that bad of a player. I just feel like his game, specifically on this season, is one where, again, he's just simply never in that good of a spot throughout the entire game. So while, again, he does build social connections along the way. And, again, potentially could have won a jury vote, maybe. Who knows if he got into the end. And gets sniped out of the game in a very strange way i do feel like most of his game is him kind of playing from the bottom because that for me he's here at number 34 now at 33 we have a person that i do think at the end of the day like i probably look at dr mike as a better player than this person however i think this person was again in a majority for more of the game that person is brett labelle from lanager jacks and really for me like mike and brett's games in the post merge at least are not that dissimilar i mean they are people that had a very solid backing coming into the merge and to be fair i mean Brett was at least in the majority for those first few rounds. But again, once it crumbles, when Chris goes home, he's kind of more floundering around the where, I mean, he does technically go to rocks, which is actually probably a negative for him. But through that, again, that also means that he had half the tribe kind of on his side at a point. So again, that's kind of good. Only for that side to be on the losing side the following round and losing Zeke at nine. And through that, he's kind of just on the bottom until the final five where he eventually gets taken out. And taking on a spot where, again, you could argue if it was in the best interest of like Hannah and Ken to be keeping him around at that point, which I, I argue against it, but I think it's definitely something that he definitely had an argument to make on why he should stay around and ends up failing at making that argument. Now again, I think early on in the game, his game is definitely better than Dr. Mike's. Again, he is in the majority for most of the pre-swap phase of the game. Obviously, he gets blindsided the Paul Walker vote, but again, he himself was never really a target there. And beyond that, again, he obviously is on the bottom when he gets the swap that was able to get out of that situation by pulling over Jay and Will, which is also decent as well. Again, like, I think there's definitely things to praise with Brett's game. I think my issue comes from the fact that I don't know his win equity. I don't feel it was particularly high against a lot of the end gamers. I feel like he needed to get to the end against Hannah and Ken. And even then, I feel like Hannah would definitely get votes for sure against him. Well, even beyond that, again, I think his navigation through the end game was not particularly good. I feel like his early game, like, while well, fine, it wasn't also that great either. And really, even when he was in the majority, he wasn't really that central of a figure within that group. He was largely kind of a second command to Chris, where, again, like, I don't particularly look at his game that highly, but it's enough for him to be here at number 33. Number 32. We're moving on to a player that had a very turbulent game like the last few we've talked about though one that i do think if she had gotten to the end i think there is a very good chance of her winning the game along the fact that she overcame a lot of adversity on this season to where it makes me want to put her a little bit higher than the last two we talked about and that person is aubrey from survivor game changers who obviously comes into this season with a massive target on her back she obviously was someone that this cast had literally just saw make it to the final three and play a very impressive game and i do think that plays a factor in the fact that she again seemed to be kind of towards the bottom of her original tribe's power structure where again she was aligned with tony and was the decoy target when tony went out after the swap she was still also kind of on the bottom of that group to where while she's never taken out herself simply due to the fact that likes the JT and Malcolm are bigger threats it still is not a particularly good game up to that point though I think when she swaps I do think she starts to do some pretty good work she builds a bond with Brad Culpepper that seems to put her in a pretty decent spot on her swap tribe at the merge again she avoids being targeted right away due to that relationship and following that like while she has like blindsight the Aussie vote and later the Andrea vote I feel like she's able to actually be in a somewhat decent position in the game at that point to where she is part of the majority group that flips against Debbie and 
holds true through voting out Zeke and Sierra. She then is able to recover immediately after getting blindsided by the Andrea vote and not be targeted the following round and proceed to almost be in a rock situation at six to where had it not been for advantage get in she would have potentially been in a pretty good spot coming into the end game where had she been able to cut Sari before the end she probably does likely win that season and mixing out the fact that again even in the situation that she's in had she been able to win out i do think she is a very likely winner but again it's still a position that again like that was very unlikely to happen or again, I think in comparison to Brett and Mike, I do look at her as a bigger jury threat by the end. Though, I just feel like she struggles with actually getting there. And considering her very rocky beginning to her game, and also some missteps post-merge. Again, it's very tough to assess her that highly. But again, considering the target that was on her back that made the path there a lot more difficult. And her still having impressive moments here and there. Again, for me, it's high enough to put her here at number 32. Number 31. We're moving on to a player that I don't think played a particularly great game on their season. It was someone that is, again, only two rounds away from winning the game that person is Dara from Pearl Islands and Dara is someone that is kind of funny in the fact that I think she kind of lucks her way into being in this position where she could have potentially won the game where again in the way the game plays out again she's at final four if she had won just two immunity challenges there at the end in a spot where again she is very good at immunity challenges she would have probably won the game I mean had she made the final immunity she more than likely wins that challenge to win the game she's obviously like failed at the final four immunity challenge though even in that I feel like her game is a bit all over the place again obviously she comes and emerge down in numbers loses her allies until they are able to blindside Rupert but then ends up being on the outs of the T vote in a spot where again she very much probably would have been the target had she not won immunity in that spot but then helps take out Krista and Burton only be taken out eventually at four and it's a game where like there's pros there's cons for for sure however i think for me again as i mentioned i think she is someone that kind of locks into this winning position where had the original morgans come to the merge of the numbers i think she's pretty much screwed unless she wins out and even then i don't think she particularly wins where again she would have been in this position to where because again she was on the bottom of that power structure the likes of t rhino and savage were always closer to each other than they were to dara even then she probably goes home in the pre-merge had not been for austin quitting the game so for me that's obviously a flaw there and considering again how inconsistent her later game is again it's tough to really put her too too highly but considering how obvious of a jury threat she was where she just very blatantly wins if she gets to the end and did have some moves here and there along the way again for me it's enough to put her here at number 31 now number 30 we're moving on to a player that was just kind of there for a lot of the game i mean they were in a pretty decent spot had numbers played out a bit differently to where they could have potentially won the game though this is someone that was on a season that was just so cut and dry that there wasn't really much they could do and that person is elizabeth from survivor australian outback and again elizabeth it was just kind of there i mean she was the last of the kuchas to be taken out she did do decent social work where again it had tina colby and heath wanting to keep her around i think that's something to at least give her some credit for but again she never really had much of a chance of getting to the end unless she had won the last two challenges though she had gotten to the end again i think she's a very likely winner i think her obviously original kuchas would have voted for her alongside probably even the likes of a jerry and amber under certain circumstances to where yeah, i think elizabeth is a very likely winner had she been able to win those last few challenges obviously the issue is the fact that she doesn't and again it's a game where she's just on the bottom the entire post merge but Again, it's a situation where again it's just a season that is not very dynamic it's a very early season of the show to where you would expect that power structure to hold and it's a game that was pretty much lost at the merge to where you definitely say that the medevac of scooping did harm her positioning in the game where had that not happened kuja likely comes into the merge with numbers and through that they pretty much run the season to where again elizabeth very likely gets to the very end of the game so to be fair in that situation i'm not entirely sure if she wins which is definitely a qualm we had there as i do think the likes of scooping and roger were probably going to be bigger jury threats though at the same time roger potentially would have just laid down his sword for elizabeth i think that's definitely not how the run possibility either to where again like i think elizabeth doesn't really have much of a game to criticize just due to the fact that it felt like so much of the game was just dictated at the merge where there wasn't really much she could do at a season this old school to where while she doesn't have much power throughout a lot of the game it's simply a position because she couldn't have much power just due to the way that this season was structured so because i was a bit unsure where exactly to land her but i didn't end up leaving her behind here number 30 number 29 we're moving on to another player that i think if this person had gotten the numbers after the merge I think they're a very likely winner, though I think there's more to criticize from this player. They'll also do for a little more to prop up this player as well than Elizabeth, and that person is Spencer from Survivor Kageon. And again, Spencer plays a game where he's obviously on the bottom for most of the game. I mean, while he is in a decent position on the original Brains tribe initially to where they blindside David, and it seemed like him, Eric, and Cass were going to be running the tribe. Obviously, Cass flips on him there, and he ends up being on the bottom, barely getting saved at the Jatia vote, seemingly 
originally due to challenge strength, which was even that necessary for a tribe because they're going to swap the following round. But following that, I think he actually plays decently well at the swap. Again, he's able to build relationships with Jeremiah and Sarah, which seemed like an alliance that would have held post-merge. And he ends up being one of the main strategists for that group to where, again, they almost pull off this really big move against the opposition at the merge vote where they tricked both Tony and LJ into wasting their idols only to put the votes on Jeffra. Though, obviously, it was all for naught as Cass flips anyway. But again, had Cass not flipped, I do think Spencer's in a very good spot to win the game. I do think his alliance with Sarah and Jeremiah would have probably run the game. I do think if Spencer had gotten to the end against someone that wasn't Sarah or Tasha from his group, I think he's a very likely winner. Now, obviously, the issue is that that didn't happen. And in this situation that he did play, and he's on the bottom, the rest of the post merge. Though even then, I don't think it's playing like terribly. It's just the fact that he's just out of the numbers and Tony is playing better. Where again, he is looped in on the LJ and the Jeffra votes. He does play his idol incorrectly at the Jeremiah vote, but I don't really fault him too, too much for that. He then obviously wins out towards the end of winning immunities in those last few rounds. But again, he was so close to winning pretty decidedly there. Where had he won those last two challenges, he wins the game. So again, I think there is a lot to praise here. Where again, had he been in the numbers in the post-merge, I think he's a very likely winner just from very much dominating the game. And even in the situation where he didn't, he was still very close to just winning the game. For a while, there's obviously qualms we had the fact that he was on the bottom for most of the actual game we saw. I do feel like there's enough good there to put him here at number 29. Now, number 28, we're moving on to a player that I kind of struggled with where to put this person as I think on paper, this person should be higher on this list. I think you would assume this person would be a pretty solid player, though. I think when looking at her game, it's not particularly good. And that person is Lauren Harp from Survivor 44. And Lauren is, again, someone that if she had made it to the end against and probably not Jam Jam or Carson, I think she probably wins the season. She was someone that was relatively high on her initial tribe's power structure to where, while there definitely was the likes of Matthew and Kane who were talking about taking her out, it did seem seemed like she had close relationships to the likes of Jamie and Brandon and even after Carson swaps over he supposedly had a really close relationship with her to where again, I do think Lauren was a big power player on the original Ratu tribe though the problem is that the post merge for the Ratu tribe is a bit all over the place to where while they're able to get the advantage coming into the final 10 round they're then completely outplayed by the Tikas who allow Brandon to be sniped out of the game and then following that again they lose Kane and while she's able to fight back and take out Franny and Danny, I think you very much debate if that's actually the optimal move at that point to be taking out them over the likes of Jam Jam and Carson. Or at that point, she just ends up being on the bottom of the power structure, eventually taken out at five. Again, like I think it's a very middling game, a game where, again, she is a power player. She is at least playing the game actively. I just don't think she's playing it well. They're seeming to make decisions that are just further sinking her game and taking out people that would have been beneficial to her game. Again, really enabling the Tika power structure a bit too much to where, for me, again, I feel like it's tough to put Lauren much higher here just simply due to the fact that, again, I don't feel like she did much to really actively benefit her game in the post-merge, but again, it's still the game that had win equity and one that at least had some agency at points, so there's also other points where she just simply is on the outs, though. And for me, it's enough to put her here at number 28. At number 27, and now we're getting to some players that I feel like were people that were in the majority for most of their seasons, though I think really lacked a lot of agency that would have bettered their positions in getting to the end. But this person being probably the one of the initial people we're going to be running through here that probably had the least amount of chance of winning the game. That was someone that I think actually played decently well at points and that person is Jason from Survivor Samoa and you know, Jason's a player that I've always really liked. I always liked Jason particularly early on in his season where he always seemed like a very cerebral player. He seemed to be one that really played off of Russell really well and really leading a lot of the strategy on FOA FOA. The problem is that you could very much tell that Jason just got tired and got depleted out there just due to the terrible conditions that were there on Samoa to where by the end of the game, you could just tell he was just simply not in it anymore. And through that, he essentially ends up becoming a massive goat towards the end, where he never bothered making much relationships with the Glues. He was looked at someone that just laid around camp all the time and didn't do anything, simply because, again, he was so depleted out there that it really harmed his jury chances, where it's something that's a bit tough to assess with Jason. Because, again, I do think there is good there. Again, like, early on, I think he was playing very well. I mean, after the merge, and he is part of the faux faux group that ends up taking down an 8-4 to four majority, which is a pretty insane thing to happen 
and it's just the fact that again I think Jason played a pretty minimal role in all that along the fact that again he just simply did not really do the leg work to really win the game in the end where again he eventually gets taken out at five not even because he's a threat or anything but mostly because they just thought he would not be able to win a challenge against Brett which is kind of humorous in the fact that he actually won challenges up to that point in the season unlike Natalie but like I think Jason's game isn't particularly good so while he was in a good position early on does end up being part of the group that dominates the post merge he just simply had no win equity and wasn't really a major player in the back half of the game they were for me again it's enough to put him here at number 27 now number 26 we're moving on to a player that was in the majority group really up until the very very end of the game and had a decent amount of win equity though they just really had no real path to the end that person is rick from survivor south pacific and rick is a player that, again i think if he had gotten to the end i think he is a massive jury threat especially against anybody but ozzy in the end game where while rick was again just someone that was really boring tv he supposedly was someone that most people liked while out there but at the same time i mean he didn't really do that much in the game i mean obviously he was part of the majority group that formed right away again with coach sophie albert and brandon the problem is that he's ozzy on the outs of that unknowingly where he doesn't know that coach is closer to sophie and albert than he is to him but even despite that i mean he almost makes it to the very end of the game to where again the Upolu group ends up completely dominating the post merge of the game again I don't know how much of that you really credit Rick for but again they do end up doing so or again had this been a season without Redemption Island I mean Rick is at final four in a position where he just needs to win where he just needs to win one challenge and wins the game though as it doesn't happen but again like I still think he definitely has high prospects if he had gotten to the end and was in a dominant alliance for most of the game just had very little to do with how that group dominated but again for me that is still enough to put him here at number 26 Number 25, we're moving on to a player that is pretty much the same thing. I think this person has a very similar game to Rick, and actually worse in the sense that this person was outright in the majority for more of their season. However, I think he also has other little pros that put him above him, and that person is Rupert from Survivor All-Stars. And Rupert's Survivor All-Stars game, I think, is just a very tough one to really grade in the sense that Yes, he is part of Robin Amber's majority alliance that ends up dominating the entire game, gets to Final Four, a situation that isn't even beneficial for Robin Amber to have Rupert at four. So I think the fact that they actually take him all the way there is, again, something to at least give him a little bit credit for. I also think early on, again, on his original tribe, he was in the middle and was pretty safe, even though, again, I don't know if he makes the right decisions in that spot. And to be fair, I mean, like, even after swap, when he gets lumped into Robin Amber's alliance, I do think that's largely due to Jenna's connection to them, not really Rupert's, but... Again, I do think what Rupert does well in the end game is that he at least tries to flip over Big Tom. He builds a strong relationship with Sheehan, and he has these connections. The problem, he does really nothing with them to where he's eventually taken out at four, and a spot where even Jenna ends up flipping on him. But again, the reason Jenna flips on him is because he was such a massive jury threat, where I do think if Rupert had gotten to the end, I think he wins handily against any of the final four there. The problem is that, again, he needed to really set himself up better for that spot where he essentially put himself in a spot where he needed to win out, though at the same time, again, he at least thought he had Jenna. And to be fair, Jenna did seem to be very wishy-washy and did seem to actually think about keeping Rupert at a point. Well, I think that's a pro to give him as well, though at the same time, there's no chance that Jenna's going to take him to final two. But still, I think Rupert's game here, again, it's not the greatest. Again, it's not as consistently in the majority as Rick's was. But I do think his win equity was just undeniable. But I think by the time he gets booted, there's no one else that could beat him in the game. And was still able to make it to final four in a position that he ends up outlasting Big Tom in a spot where he really shouldn't have. And again, gets Jenna almost keeping around. So for me, that's enough to put him here at number 25. Now 24, we're going on to a player that is another one that had a lot of win equity on their season. They just simply could not get to the very end. Despite being in a pretty dominant alliance for most of the season, that person is Helen from Survivor Thailand. And again, Helen is kind of a very frustrating player. Or she is someone that had the positioning to be able to flip the game in a way that really benefited her positioning and got herself to the end, but she simply didn't. Again, she just trusted Brian way too much in the game and just allowed him to really just run the game in a spot where obviously she's eventually taken out at four. Now I will say at least something to minorly give Helen credit here over someone like a Rupert in particular is the fact that again, at least she didn't know she was on the bottom. At least it was in a spot where she was enabling a power structure that she didn't even think herself was beneficial to her. She just fully believed in Brian and again was just outright wrong, obviously. But again, it's still a position where had she been able to somehow get her way to the end, I think she handily beats everybody. Again, there's a lot of win equity there. And with someone that navigated through the early game 
interestingly at least where again like she was kind of in the middle of the tribe where she had connections to the women and the men and obviously she ends up picking the men by the end of it ends up playing a very self-preservation style of game at that point but again with someone that was in the majority for pretty much the entire game i mean she has left out the john raymond vote but outside of that again she has the numbers all the way through until the final four though again really just squanders opportunities to really flip the vote earlier which again for me is what ends up leaving here here in number 24 now number 23 we're moving on to a player that I think is an interesting one to rank here and this person being a person that was in the majority alliance for a good chunk of the game despite the fact that they really shouldn't have been and eventually they do attempt to make a big move a move that would have greatly benefited them in the game only to then fail at that that they did at least try to make the big move which is good enough to put them this high and that person is Donathan from Survivor Ghost Island and again in comparison to Helen I feel like it is an interesting comparison here and the fact that again Helen was in this position where she had the numbers to make a big move she simply didn't donathan is someone that didn't necessarily have all those numbers but again at least tried obviously he was in this position where to be fair he kind of on the bottom early on though again it's part of the morgan blind side but once that happens again he builds this really good bond with dominic and wendell to where him tom wendell and laurel really end up being this kind of secret alliance that's able to navigate through the game the problem is that obviously it's extremely beneficial to dom and wendell to where they are these massive front runners by the end of the game but it is at the final eight where again we do see donathan really want to make a move he wants to flip over to the women in a spot where they're targeting wendell however obviously laurel doesn't get on board to which again i do fault him obviously for not being able to get laurel on board but i do at least give him credit for at least trying to make the move that would have bettered his game again had that move gone through i do think it allows him and laurel to really just navigate the middle and play really both sides off each other to where again had nothing got to the end that way again who knows if he would have won now again i do think laurel just naturally has more winner potential than donathan but still I'm mean, like if Donathan had really taken charge in those last few rounds I do think he could have potentially won the game now obviously again in comparison to the last people we talked about and like Helen and Rupert they obviously had a lot more win equity than Donathan however I do think Donathan again at least seemed to have the right idea while also still being in the majority alliance so again unlike Helen Rupert Rick they all enabled this power structure that didn't really benefit them at least Donathan tried to upset that power structure and while he ends up failing to me this is attempts to try to make the optimal move there which is enough to put him here at number 23 now at number 22 we're moving on to a player that almost won the game kind of i will say i definitely qualm with how close this person got to the game and really even their position as a penultimate juror as i feel like they probably shouldn't have been but still a person that again almost wins the game and does do some impressive work here and there throughout the season that person is janet from survivor ioi and again janet is someone that obviously gets taken out at five due to the idle nullifier to where had that not happened she probably wins the game and that's something that you would think oh that's a massive pro that's the reason why she should be super high on this list however my big issue is that she shouldn't have been at five to begin with where the entire game was set up in a way that she was always going to be booted at six like the plan was to blindside her at six without her playing her idol however that got ruined by dan spilo getting ejected from the game which again would have been her completely lucking out into a winning position there had the idol nullifier not been in play so for me i don't really praise her for getting to that final five position where she could have won the game as again she shouldn't have been there to begin with that she was always going to be booted at six unless she had somehow won immunity there to where again like while i would normally consider the way that she goes out to be a wonky circumstance i really just don't do that it was a wonky circumstance that she got there to begin with but i will say i do think her game before that is interesting I mean, like, she was in the majority early on and seen the build really good social relationships that obviously led to her being a massive jury threat. On the fact that at the merge, she is on the outs there when the entire Dan Spilo situation happens, but she's miraculously able to recover from that, which I do think is very impressive. The fact that, again, she was just so far on the outs during those first couple merge rounds to where, again, it's kind of insane that she's able to get back in the majority after that. But again, to me, it's like, while she was in the majority from that point forward, it was always a power structure that didn't really lead to her winning the game and was always one where she was going to be sniped towards the end of the game because of the threat that she was in fire making along the fact that people knew she had an idol the where you know while she does very much win if she gets to the end to me it's like she never should have had that path to the end to begin with unless she had really just won out to her again i've never particularly looked at her game that highly but again the fact that she was able to recover mid-merge and had a lot of win equity is enough to put her here at number 22 now number 21 we're moving on to a couple penultimate jurors here that straight up should not have been penultimate jurors though did not play particularly great though did not play particularly great games around that that still leave him behind here but at number 21 we're starting that off with joe del campo from korong and you know, joe is someone that obviously gets matter of fact from the game at the final five a position where he was very 
very likely to make it the final three. I mean, had he not been mad of act, more than likely Michelle goes at five. He's starting Aubrey wins the challenge that would have been the immunity challenge there. And then you have him seemingly being locked in for final tribal council. The question is, can he win? And the answer is no, I don't think he can. But again, he obviously shouldn't have been a penultimate juror. So at least that's something. But really the game around that is not particularly great. I mean, he's really just this second command to Aubrey the entire game, just simply just there to enable what Aubrey is doing. And again, like it still takes something to be in this majority alliance and never seemingly be targeted, especially considering the fact that he is such a massive outlier on this cast, obviously much older than anyone else on this cast, where the fact that he's able to navigate through the early game in particular without being targeted is pretty impressive. But really, again, I don't really see much winner potential there. I also don't feel like his actual game is that impressive, where I don't feel like he really actively does much in the game. Even then, he's left out with certain votes, like the Peter vote, the Debbie vote. But considering the fact that he, again, like more than likely should have made the final tribal council, it's enough for him to land here at number 21. Now, number 20, pretty much the same thing, though this one obviously goes out in a very different circumstance, and that person is is Ben from Survivor Winners at War. And Ben is obviously someone that essentially quit the game. And that makes it a bit tough to assess. Is, I mean, at least Joe, like, didn't go out on his own terms. I mean, Ben actively took himself out of the game, which is an issue, obviously. But I do think Ben is another one that, again, was so poised to just be at Final Tribal Council. I mean, I do think had he not been voted out there, I think he more than likely is at the final three at least if he doesn't throw the fire-making challenge to Tony or something like that. But even then, again, that entire situation that occurred, occurred due to Edge of Extinction, where had this been a more natural game, I do think Ben just outright makes it to the final three without much adversity there. The problem is, can Ben win? Which again, the answer is no. I don't think Ben can win in many situations. Now, I do think there are certain situations where he could get votes, but again, just I don't feel like he ever gets the votes to win. And straight up, I do think a lot of that's obviously due to his own actions. I do think he really burn some of the jury members along the way. He also did not play a game that seemed to garner much respect from most of the jury to where, while again, I think there are impressive aspects to his game, particularly the fact that again, he was in the middle on his original tribe, and he was involved in like the Ethan blind side. He ends up leading the charge against Boston Rob after the swap, and again, by the time the merge has this very solid backing around him, being aligned with the likes of Sarah and Sophie, while also teaming up with Tony, and again, they end up really just running a lot of the game, and Again, would have more than likely gotten to the end of the game had it not been for Edge of Extinction to where, again, I think his actual navigation through the game is actually pretty solid. It's just the fact that he had no real win equity that obviously detracts him. But at the same time, again, he was even going to be booted when he did unless he quit the game in the way that he did. So he was even naturally getting taken out before the end. So for me, again, it's enough to prop him up here. He's here at number 20. Number 19, we're moving on to a player that I also don't feel like I had much of a chance to win the game. Though at least this person was trying to win the game and that person is Baylor. Obviously from San Juan, though, sir. And I think Baylor's game is a really interesting one. The fact that she was instantly kind of on the outs on her original tribe. Obviously, there was a men's alliance there to where she was left out of that. Though, despite that, again, she builds this really strong bond with Josh and ends up trying to play the middle there. And while she definitely could have been a potential target, if they had gone the more tribal, she's able to survive to the swap where once she's with her mom, she ends up being in a much more dominant position at that point. Obviously, building a strong bond with John and Jacqueline where they end up running a lot of the game. I mean, coming into the merge, they really are these power players that again take out Josh then flip the vote on Jeremy and then we have Baylor kind of doing her own thing and also working alongside Natalie Anderson and they end up finding an idol together and end up being this duo that eventually topples John Mish though obviously the issue there is the fact that obviously she gets taken out by Natalie by the end though even then she's taken out by an idol play a play that was simply done to obviously better Natalie's odds of surviving the final four round not because Baylor herself was much of a threat in the game as again I don't think Baylor can win at the end I do think she very much struggles against most people even if she was there for her mom I think her mom is more likely to get jury votes than her to where I, I do very much see Baylor really struggling to win the game but again I do think her navigation through the game is somewhat impressive again the fact that she is in a dominant position from the swap on and, and even during her early days I feel like there is some impressive play there to avoid the target on her back to where again for me even though I do think she very much lacked in win equity I think for me it's enough to put her here at number 19 number 18 another person that also also lacked a lot of win equity, but I do think this person at least had bigger pros to their game, and that person is Natalie Bolton from Survivor Micronesia. And Natalie is someone that I think is a interesting player, obviously. She is someone that is part of the Black Widow Brigade and does pull off the Eric Blind side, obviously a crowning achievement there. Though, I think the rest of her game outside that is just 
kind of middling to where she is in the majority for most of that game, though I do feel like she doesn't really play as big of a role in the strategy of the game as much as like Sisseri or Parvati or even seemingly Alexis, to where again she was very close to Alexis and really worked with her throughout the entire game. The problem is that Alexis is someone that would have beaten her at the end, where Natalie didn't seem to have much respect from this cast. I do think if she had gotten to the end, I do think she struggles to win a jury vote. Or while she can get certain votes at the end, I do feel like the likes of Sari and Parvati more than likely beat her. Obviously, I feel like she like really burned some jury members from the likes of like a Jason and an Eric. Though again, I think she navigates through the game in a pretty impressive way. I mean, even on the original fans tribe, she's pretty much in the middle of that group alongside like Alexis and one of the people that ends up voting against the Mikey B and Marys of the world. And then once she swaps, she builds a really strong bond with Parvati and that ends up leading up to the creation of the Black Widow Brigade to where again, like I don't feel like she was one of the main players within that group, but still obviously them as a group did pull off some really insane moves and obviously I give her some credit for the Eric blindside in particular but still just like kind of a middling game one that I do feel like had very little inequity to it though considering her position in the majority for a lot of the game and her obviously pulling off a pretty big move at five even though again at that point it was a pretty much a self-preservation move and for me it's enough to put it here at number 18. Now number 17 we're moving on to a player that I know a lot of people say is a really bad player and there definitely are things to criticize of this player especially how snowed they were by the person that eventually won this season, but they're also a person that was in the dominant lines for a lot of seasons, still had some win equity by the end, and that person is Alicia from Survivor One World, and again, Alicia was again in the majority for a lot of the season. I mean, she was someone that was in the majority alliance that Kim had that obviously enabled Kim to really just completely run the game, but Alicia was the other person in that group that actually had her own people. I mean, while Kim again like was in this position where pretty much everyone wanted to go to the end with her. Elisa still had people like Christina and Tarzan as these potential goats that she could have dragged to the end. And obviously she doesn't and doesn't because she's tricked by Kim into getting rid of Tarzan and eventually just loses the battle at five, but do you feel like Alicia is someone that at least had this winning scenario until she was outplayed by one of the best players of all time? Or even beyond that, I mean, even earlier on, I mean, she swapped screwed essentially and is able to survive that, and to be fair, I don't agree with her behavior during that. I think she acts very mean-spiritedly to Christina in particular, though I still think she makes the correct move for her game in taking out Monica, and again, just essentially playing to try to get to the merge, while also building a strong relationship with Colton, where, and I think there is stuff to like here from Alicia's game to where, again, had she gotten together against Christine and Tarzan, I think she is a very likely winner. So it's the fact that she had a winning scenario and had these other loyal allies that could have potentially gotten her to the end only for her to be tricked by Kim at the last second. I feel like it's enough for me to put her here at number 17. Now number 16, moving on to a much more recent player of the show. Actually, the most recent Planet Ultimate Juror, we do have Julie from Survivor 45. And Julie is a tough player to assess here. And the fact that she was obviously in the majority alliance for most of the season. Again, she's part of the Reba 4 that really just ends up steamrolling this season. The problem is that she's on the bottom of that pecking order the entire time, in a position where they obviously do attempt to blindside her at 7 only for her to be able to play her idol, which too fair again is due to her strong relationship with D, but still the majority of the tribe wander out there to where she had to use an idol to even get to Final 5 and even then at Final 5, as she makes a really dumb move there and still voting for Jake instead of playing for self-preservation and gets sniped out of the game there in a very wonky vote, but again a vote where I think she actively plays it really wrong. And like to be fair, I actually thought about putting Julie higher on this list than this, even despite those flaws. As again, I do think she gets voted out in a weird vote, and she was in the majority alliance for a lot of the game. The reason she's not higher on the list, though, is because even when she was in the majority alliance, even though she was doing a lot for that alliance, and again, playing up this role of being on the bottom, even though she really was, to try to pacify the people around them, and not thinking that the Rebas were together, that also means that she essentially had other options in the game that she simply didn't utilize. She instead took out those other options to get into an end game where she had to play an idol at seven, which I think is really bad. Also, she never really gets her way within her own majority group, despite having these connections with other people. Though, again, like she didn't want to keep those people around, she just failed at doing so and just ended up catering to what her alliance wanted to do. Now, I do think at the end of the day, again, she did seem to have a lot of win equity, which is something to definitely prop her up here, along with the fact 
Morgan again. She gets sniped out of the game in a weird way, but considering the fact that she needed to use an idol to even get to the penultimate juror spot, along with the fact that she didn't seem to actually get her way at many points throughout the game, for me, it's enough to leave her behind here at number 16. Now, number 15, moving on to a player that I really want to assess higher. I feel like there definitely is a lot of acumen in this person's game, though at the end of the day, I feel like even though they did make a big move towards the end, it was a move that was necessary due to all the mistakes they made beforehand. That person is Sierra Easton from Survivor Blood versus Water, to where, again, Sierra, I think, has a decent amount of win equity in the game. If she had somehow made her way to the end, I think she definitely is a very probable winner by the time of the final five. I think also, again, she obviously makes the rock draw move, where had her group come out of that in the number, she's also a very likely winner. Now, technically, I think Hayden beats her, but if she's able to get Hayden out by the end, I think she more than likely wins the game. So those are decent pros. At least claim that everything came down to a rock draw. The problem is that it came down to a rock draw because of the mistakes she made leading up to that, where straight up, I mean, like, her early game is not particularly good. Again, she's on the bottom. Though, to be fair, it's a tribe that is, like, mostly dominated by the men. Turk is saying she is, like, one of the women that's able to squeak on by. I feel like that's pretty good. She's able to get Caleb to flip to save her and take out Brad. That's also very good. At the swap, again, she's able to re integrate to where she's in a pretty decent spot at that point. And after the merge, we see her working alongside Tyson. The problem is that, again, she really enables a power structure that she's not really that well positioned in. And she is essentially playing for fourth for a lot of that game. And, like, pretty much fails at final seven, final eight. And at eight, where she fails to save her mom. And at seven, where she enables. She again just allows Tyson to really just run the game. Though, again, that's the reason why she had to go to Rocks to begin with at six. So, again, it's a game that, again, like she had a lot of win equity, and I do very much praise her for going to Rocks. But the fact that she put herself in that position to begin with is obviously a major issue, which is why she's here at number 15. Now, number 14, we're moving on to a player that has a really interesting game to assess, one that is a bit more rocky than someone like Jens. Though, I think there's definitely a lot of impressive aspects to this person's game, and that person is Lorne O'Connell from Survivor Edge of Extinction. And Lorne is someone that I think plays, again, a very good early game. I mean, she is in the majority that ends up sticking true to where, despite the fact that she is being targeted alongside Kelly Wentworth, they're able to maintain their numbers, even to the likes of David and Rick's detriment to where, when they end up swapping into essentially their original tribe, that puts Kelly in a really powerful position there, to where they really just steamroll to the merge, to where, again, like, Lauren is in a very good spot up until the merge. But once coming through merge, I mean, they're down in numbers, and they don't play particularly well there either. It's where they're blindsided by the Joe vote off, though after again she's back in the majority for a bit, though too fair, I don't know how much she's really playing a factor into that. But again, involved in the Eric blindside, involved in taking out Julia, but then proceeds to be blindsided at the Wentworth vote. Though I think once the Wentworth vote happens, she has a bit of a resurgence in her game to where she really picks up numbers and working alongside Gavin and Victoria and Julie, to where they end up really running the middle portion of the game, taking out the big threats one by one by one, only to obviously be harmed by the fact that Rick Devins keeps on winning out and has idols and everything. I think once Chris returns at Final Six is kind of where her game really kind of blows up there. She obviously uses her idol on Chris, which ends up leading to her being vulnerable at five and her getting taken out there, though too fair taken out by idols. But again, it feels like this culmination of her saving Chris at the Final Six, which is pretty insane. And like, to be fair, even then, even if she had gotten to the end, I don't know if she wins. While she definitely would have gotten votes, I don't feel like she had the most respect from the jury. I do feel like Gavin would have beaten her at the end if, if she had gotten there over Chris, to where, again, I do think there definitely are things to criticize from Lauren's game, particularly her win equity and her, again, being in and out of the majority at points in the merge. But I do think the fact that she plays a pretty stable game after the Kelly Wentworth vote off and, again, had a pretty impressive early game is enough for me to land her here at number 14. Number 13, and moving on to a player that I've also been conflicted about with this person having impressive aspects to their game, but doesn't quite fully put it together by the end. And that person is Carla from Survivor 43. And Carla was obviously in a dominant position on her original tribe. I mean, she really leads those initial votes with her having James and Cassidy and Lindsay as an initial alliance, but it also has the alliance with Geo and Ryan and ends up really dictating the action on her original tribe. And once getting to emerge, again, things go well for her initially. I think she builds a really strong bond with Jesse, and we obviously see people outside of her alliance going out at first. Though I think it's when we get to Split Tribal that her game really just starts to go downhill. She obviously lets James go, 
in a position where she could have saved him and he was a very important number for her down the road. She obviously starts to distrust Cassidy and turns on Cassidy, which is bad for her game. All putting her in this position where she really had no real allies by the time of the final six and gets tricked into using her idol there and then eventually gets taken out at five. Again, it's a pretty bad end game stretch to where I really feel like she just plays really the final 10 on just all wrong. So while she is still in the majority for like the Noel vote and the Sammy vote, I do feel like she is still in this position where she's essentially poised to be taken out by the time of the final five. But the thing is like also Carla did have a lot of win equity if Carla got to the end against someone that wasn't Jesse or Cody. I think she is a very likely winner. Also the fact that again, I think she really dominated her early tribe and again was playing someone decent well even after the merge to where I do think there are definitely things to really praise here for Carla. But I do think her disastrous end of her game for me is, makes it tough to put her much higher here than number 13. Now number 12, we're moving on to kind of a series of penultimate jurors here that I all look at pretty similarly. I mean, these are people in a row that I think were in, again, rocky positions at points, but still navigated through the post-merge with a lot of win equity while also having some moves to their name. And at number 12, we're starting all that off with Allison from Survivor Day vs. Goliath. And Allison is someone that I did struggle with where to land her on. I did consider putting her lower on the list simply because of the fact that she was kind of on the bottom of every power structure she was a part of. Of and seemed to be someone that was just waiting to be taken out until five. Though I do think her game is actually pretty competent for the most part. Again, like even though, yeah, there are points where she's left out of vote, she's pretty much in a majority group for most of the season. So, I mean, she's decently positioned on the original Goliath tribe. She then is essentially the swing after the swap in the merge she is again kind of in the middle of the game at that point and while they do end up siding with the goliaths again she is technically part of the majority even though they're not getting in their way due to all the advantages that davids have but obviously it gets to the point where they're outnumbered and she loses alec though even beyond that again like while she is a massive target from the final nine on she's still able to survive not through just winning challenges she actually survives through social strategy means again she survives over carl in the final nine vote at the final eight vote despite an idol being in play she has a backup in place to where gabby gets taken out there she gets christian now at seven along with getting davy out at six to where again she makes it all the way to final five purely on social strategy means which i do think is very impressive for someone that had such a massive target on their back but obviously the problem is that she was always going to be sniped before the end it feels like she had no real chance of making it to the end unless she won out but still she navigates through the middle merge phase of the game pretty well and i do feel like earlier on she was pretty decently positioned as well while she also had a lot of win equity if she had gotten to the end i think she beats most people so yeah i think there's a lot to like here and that's why she's here number 12 for me now number 11 we're moving on to again a player i look at pretty similarly though one that avoided the target on her back for a lot of season despite also again having some win equity at least and that person is sierra don thomas from survivor worlds apart now again, i think there are things that sierra does better than allison i think there are things that she does worse i think the things that she does better is the fact that again managing her threat level i think she's also just outright in the majority for more of the game where again it feels like allison was out of the loop on more votes than sierra was where sierra's really only out of the loop on the Lindsay vote and beyond that again is a pretty big power player in the game is a major swing after the swap after the merge she reintegrates within her original alliance and ends up being in a pretty good spot of being able to play multiple sides and build good relations with both sides so where again i do think if she had gotten to the end i do think she is a very feasible winner there again she was someone that the no callers actually like to where that obviously gives her a advantage there while well, she also had some pretty good relationships with the likes of carolyn and dan and mike to where i feel like she definitely could win if she had gotten to the end there the problem is that obviously she is voted out of final five in a situation where she's essentially voted out just due to the fact that she's a challenge threat and mike wanted to get rid of a challenge threat before the end so she couldn't even keep carolyn on her side by the end of that so i think that's like a bit of an issue but really i feel like her game is actually a pretty solid one a pretty consistent one where again like she's just in a really strong position for a lot of the post-merge phase of the game and kind of gets unfortunate by the fact that Mike ends up winning out towards the end. So I think if she had gotten to the end, I think she would have been a very affable presence to where I could definitely see a jury voting for her over the likes of, again, a Rodney, a Carolyn, who definitely had other detractors. So I do think she was a somewhat decent jury threat while also being in the majority for a lot of the game. So again, for me, that's enough to put her here in number 11. Now number 10, and moving on to a player that is probably one of the more underrated players in the grand scheme of Survivor, someone that was in a very strong position to really just run the game. And while the game crumbles for them at the very end they still have some impressive things happen at the tail end of the game as well and that person is jen lyon from survivor palau and again jen and greg on that season were in a very strong position and obviously to be fair they never had to go to tribal that much in the pre-merge where that obviously benefited them but by the time of the 
quote unquote merge, you do have them being in a power position. The problem is that they kind of squander that position the where I think they wait a bit too long to try to make the move on Tom and Ian and where again, they had numbers and people like a Kobe and a Stephanie, they'll just never really make the necessary moves with them to where again, they get blindsided at sixth where Jen obviously ends up staying over Greg. Though again, despite that, again, Jen should have been the very clear final five boot yet somehow they vote out Karen instead, which I think is impressive for her, along with the fact that she then proceeds to flip Tom back over at the Final Four, in a position where, again, like, Tom probably just outright goes if he doesn't win Final Four immunity. So at that point, like, Jen is by far the biggest jury threat on the board. I think she probably beats really anybody but Tom, and even Tom, I think, would have been a battle, where the fact that she actually almost makes it to the tail end of the game there, I think is very, very impressive. Again, she literally gets to fire making at four, only be taken out there. Now again, I think she would be higher on my list if she wasn't essentially on the outs from final six on. And I wish she was probably a bit more strategically active in the game where, where it felt like Greg was someone that was more out in front than her. But I still feel like Jen is a really solid game on this season. Again, enough for me to put her here. Number 10. Now number nine, we're moving on to again, a similar player. One that I probably have a bigger hole with this person's game. But I think their game as a whole is again, another pretty consistently strong one. That person is Lindsay from Survivor 42. And again, Lindsay, I think is a similar player. I think they're these pretty decent all around players that make it very deep into the game in a position where they could have won the game. Again, I think if Lindsay gets to the end, I think she beats everybody of that final five. And I think you'd even argue she probably beats Omer as well the where I, I think she had a lot of win equity on that season the problem is that i think she actively puts herself in the position where she gets taken out at five where unlike sierra who seems to get unlucky of mike's continuous immunity challenge wins or allison who again at least coming into that round thought she had mike and Kara, I feel like Lindsay is someone that came into the final five round pretty much dead to rights. And a lot of it being due to her own actions. Again, the fact that she doesn't play her idol at the last opportunity that she can on Omer in that round is really ridiculous. Like it's an astronomically dumb move. I think it's kind of forgotten about at how dumb of a move that is. So that is something that didn't make me want to detract from her game. But like straight up, I do think her game is more consistent than those other two. Again, she's someone that is in the majority for really the entire game up to that point. Again, there's never really a point where she's like out of the loop on what's going on. She's always involved in the vote and it's usually a pretty important number in the game. Now, again, I think at the end of the day, I don't really see her as like this big strategist. I don't feel like she was the one like leading the charge on any of these votes, but she was again, a solid member of the majority and a member that again, could have very likely won if she had gotten to the end. To where again, just straight up, I think her game was a lot more stable than the last few people we talked about. Well, also, I think her win equity is a lot more undisputed than the last people we've talked about, where from what we've heard from the jury, it just seems seems like a foregone conclusion that she would have won if she had gotten to the end. The problem is that I feel like she actively ruins her game coming into that final five round, which makes it tough to really assess her too highly. But again, I think there definitely are massive pros to her game, which, and that's why she's here at number nine and number eight. And really, I feel like at this point, we're in the top tier of the list. I feel like these are the people that I look at as more dominant penultimate jurors for whatever that's worth. Again, people that either played against semi-dominant games or people that were just kind of screwed over. However, we're starting it off with a person that I do debate if they should be in this tier. This is a person that I've always qualmed with how exactly they were positioned in the game. And that person is Taj from Survivor Token Chains. And I think when people talk about Taj, they always talk about her as someone that was running the game alongside JT and Steven. However... I don't fully look at it that way. Now, obviously for the sake of this list, she is essentially ranked as that, but I do feel like Taj is someone that was very much clearly on the bottom of that trio and also probably the least integral of that trio to their success in the post-merge. Again, with the post-merge, we see the likes of JT and Steven making relationships with Coach and Debbie and Tyson, but we never really see Taj doing any of that. We see Taj again playing together this power structure of Brendan and Sierra, only just the completely waste that coming into the merge and flip on them. We see Taj also just seemingly be okay with being taken out by the end of the game, where again, she always was expecting to be taken out at three. She also someone that I don't know if she could win the game. Like straight up, I do think the likes of JT and Steven were bigger jury threats than her. For a while, I think she could definitely beat like someone like an Aaron and, and again, who knows about like someone like a coach. Again, she was never really getting to the end with them. So I feel like she was essentially playing a losing game for the entire season. However, again, I do think there is definitely credit to give her. Again, the fact that she comes into the merge and having a six 
to three deficit by the time the final nine is able to recover from that is still impressive. I just feel like, again, it was the work of other people that allowed her to get through that more so than her own navigation through the game. Even earlier on in the game, she was looked at as someone that was towards the bottom of the Jalapal power structure. And again, she builds a good relationship with Steven and JT and used her idol effectively there to build trust to where, again, like there definitely is good there. But I do think her game is kind of overrated as time goes on, as people looking at her as like this dominant player alongside JT and Steven that had as much win equity as them when I just simply don't really agree with that. But I do think there is a lot good here, which is why she's still here at number eight. Now, number seven, we're moving on to a player that I don't really know what to do with this person. This is a person that gets taken out at five in a position where they essentially had to win out after making one of the biggest moves of the season. But it's also a move I feel like they kind of had to make at the time that they did. And really, just as a whole, I think their game is kind of rocky. But still, at number seven, I am going to go for Ricard from Survivor 41. And again, Ricard is someone that you could definitely have qualms with this game. I think earlier on, again, you could definitely criticize the fact that Shan was someone that was doing a lot of the legwork for the duo. And getting Ricard through the game. The, through that, I think you could also say that Ricard did a lot of good social work to get Shan to do so. Again, where they end up being the final two of their tribe, which is pretty insane that he survives through all that despite not having the greatest connections with his own tribe. I do think after the merge, I think Ricard actually plays pretty well. I think it is kind of understated how well he plays during the early merge portion of the game to where, oh well, yeah, he probably would have been targeted if he did not have Shan protecting him. I still think he does really good work in pulling in the likes of Erica and Heather, pulling in Xan and having these votes lined up for the eventual time that he needs to make the move on Shan, which again, he does do impressive work to undercut Shan along the way. Again, obviously taking out Nasir, who is a number for Shan, also getting her to waste the extra vote along the way. Also, literally organizing the votes against her at final eights in a position where I feel like he kind of had to make the move there. And like, obviously that is a big criticism that people talk about is that he made the move too early. I do feel like, well, obviously optimally, yes, he could have made the move later. I don't feel like it was actually a practicality. I mean, Shan and had an idol while also being part of an alliance that he knew that he was not a part of that would have had the outright majority if they survived that round while also them having the plan of taking out a very integral number for his game and Erica to where again I do feel like he needed to make the move when he did and again that alliance had his back the following round the problem is that after that he did essentially need to win out and that does show some failings in his game but I do think again like I think the Shan move and the level of difficulty of the move is pretty impressive I think he does a lot of great lead work to lead up to that move I think earlier on the way that he's able to get Shan to keep him in the game is also very impressive and I think he did have a lot of win equity in the game I think if he gets to the end against most people after the Shan boot, I think he probably wins. I think Erica's, again, a bit of a wonky vote. I think he probably beats everybody else to where, again, I do think Ricard is a player that I think people have kind of mixed opinions on. I do think he is one that I do still look at his game largely pretty highly. But again, for the sake of this list, I can't put him higher considering the fact that, again, he essentially needed to win out to have any chance of even making it that far. And again, you can definitely criticize his social game in the first half of the game to where, again, like for me, I can't put him much higher here than number seven. Now, number six, we're moving on to a player that I don't really know what to do with this person. This person made a couple big moves in the season, some of the bigger moves of the season, but also played a very, very sloppy game. And that person is Kenny from Survivor Gabon. And again, like Kenny, I just have a very tough time assessing him as a player. I mean, he, again, organizes two of the biggest votes of the season and takes out Ace. In position where he tricks Sugar into voting out one of her closest allies. He then blindsides Marcus, obviously one of the biggest threats to win the game and the leader of the majority alliance at that point in the game. Again, those are two massive moves, along with being very integral and keeping the votes onto Charlie at the final nine. Again, like I think Kenny is someone that you definitely do give a lot of credit for those moves. However, I also feel like Kenny is just a very sloppy player. Again, like the way that he plays the final seven round and putting the vote onto Maddie is just really idiotic there. It really ends up sinking his game where that causes Maddie and Sugar to flip on him at six. And he's essentially a dead man walking at five, just always trying to like guilt trip Bob into giving him his immunity necklace, which I mean, to be fair, that is a part of some unluckiness in his game. The fact that Bob does win as many challenges as he does that puts Kenny in a worse spot, though I still feel like at the end of the day, Kenny's play in that back portion of the game is just super sloppy. It makes it out of the fact that, again, like even early on in the game, he was not particularly well positioned in his group. Again, he wasn't on the bottom necessarily, but again, he wasn't necessarily leading the charge in any way. But again, pretty deep into the swap, he does start to make some pretty good moves. Again, he makes two of the bigger moves of the season while also being in the majority until the tail end of the game. So again, for me, it is enough to put him here at number six. Now, number five, we're moving on to a player that 
did not play the greatest game in the world, straight up. However, this person's this high simply because I feel like this person was a person that was very much screwed over in the game. I feel like this is a person that had the game played out a bit more naturally. I think this person could very likely have made it to the end of the game, and who knows if they could have won. I don't think they could, but they maybe could. And that person is Adam from Survivor Cook Islands. And again, Adam is someone that, had it not been for the bottle twist, I do think Adam is a very likely finalist of the season. Again, had the Raros come into the merge with just one more number, again, I think it's very likely that Adam just steamrolls the season alongside Parvati and Candace, and they get the three. So again, Parvati probably wins. I don't think Adam is that likely of a winner there. But again, I do think he gets very unlucky in how that game plays out. Where really, he was essentially in a dominant position for the first half of the game. Again, him and, where really, him and Parvati were very central figures in the Rero power structure and were able to get their way for most of that game. So once after Muni, it felt like just everything was going their way, only for, again, the bottle twist to really screw things up. And also, to be fair, I mean, they do come in the merge still in the numbers, though obviously Penner flips over, which again, is definitely a failing on them and not keeping Penner in line. Though also, you can also say that, again, it's also the god idol that lost them that battle as well, where, again, I do think there's just aspects of Adam getting kind of screwed over. Even though I don't think Adam plays particularly well, he was still in a pretty dominant position early on. I think he would have been in a dominant position had his tribe retained numbers after the merge. And even despite that, he's still the last person standing from his side to where he makes it all the way to final five. And had he won the last few challenges, I think there's at least a chance that he could win the game. Again, not a big one, but again, at least a chance to where, again, I think he's just a person that I look at as pretty screwed over in the game just due to outside circumstances. And because of that for me, he's here at number five. Now number four. And again, this is essentially the people that I actually kind of look at as dominant players, which is funny that it's literally only four four of 45 but we're starting it off with the player that despite this person really running a lot of the game they also had literally zero win equity which is why they can't be higher than this and that person is sue hawk from survivor borneo and again sue does run the game alongside the other toggies and i think is a very integral number for the toggies to where Again, she is someone that, despite the fact that Richard gets most of the credit for the creation of the alliance, it is really her and Kelly that initially form that alliance and loop Richard into it after the fact. She's also one of the more active players on this cast. We do see her really strategizing with Richard at many points in the season to where, again, I do think the domination of the Tagi 4 is something that I do give shared credit to between Rich and Sue to where... Obviously, Rich ends up winning the battle at Final Four, but I do think Sue deserves a lot of credit for how they navigate through the game. Now, at the end of the day, again, she didn't particularly treat people well, and people didn't like her to where she would not have won if she had gotten to the end. But again, she still was in a very dominant position, played a very dominant game. It's just that her lack of win equity is something that makes it very tough to put her much higher on this list, which is why she's here at number four. Now, number three. Three, we're moving on to another pretty dominant player from an early season of the show. That player is Big Tom from Survivor Africa, which again, I can't believe Big Tom is this high on this list. But again, like he was in a dominant position for a lot of the game. Him, Ethan, and Lex were really just running that entire season. And even in positions where they could have potentially lost the numbers, it was never Big Tom that was going to take the fall for that. It was always Lex that was the bigger target ahead of them. To where again, like while the vote could have flipped to the final nine, it was Lex that was being targeted there. So Big Tom did have good connections to the people outside of his original alliance, particularly like a Frank and a Kim Powers, to where I do think if Big Tom had gotten to the end, I think it would have been interesting on who wins. Now, again, my gut tells me he doesn't win against either Lex or Ethan, but again, you never really know. And But to be fair, I think he beats most people outside of Lex and Ethan. I do think Big Tom was a big jury threat in the game, though again, just one that didn't really make the move when he needed to. I think in an optimal world, he would have probably made the move to take out Lex at some point along the way and try to earn Ethan's true loyalty and again would have ideally caught him at the end but again like that's not really the way that Big Tom plays and that's not really how the game was played at the time of Survivor Africa but again, I still think at the end of the day he was in this dominant alliance and was actually doing things outside of his group to try to get people to target Lex which I think is something that you have to give him some credit for and along with that he also gets very unlucky at what happens at the final four where again had the incorrect question at the Fallen Comrades challenge not occurred and Lex had one immunity again he's safe there anyway and gets the three where again he's probably still voted out of three but he still gets kind of screwed over at the fact that he was fourth place. Where again, I feel like there's enough here to really consider him as a pretty dominant player for someone that was a penultimate juror. And because of that for me, he's here at number three. Now number two, and this was tough. I think the top two for me were pretty definitive. These were both people that were really, really screwed over in the way that they were taken out at four. Both being people that were in very strong positions for a lot of the game. However, for me, I sadly had to go with the person that I like more being in the number two spot. And that person is Sari Fields in her game from Survivor Panama. And 
Suri, again, having her at number two here was tough. I think there's a lot to like from both of these people's games. Where, again, straight, I think Suri is obviously the better player than the number one person. I think Suri also navigated through the game in a more impressive way than the number one person. The problem for me with Suri, in comparison to the number one person, is that, one, I think she gets taken out due to more genuine means. Again, she at least got votes in the trial that she got taken out at. Again, she obviously has to go to fire making. But again, I do think that comes down to her failing to secure Terry's vote in a position where she very much should have been able to. Now, obviously, at the end of the day, I mean, like, she gets screwed over by the fact that Terry has the god idol in a position where Terry would have just been voted out in that situation. But again, that's why she's this high on this list is because how well screw over she was. But even beyond that, obviously, she does dominate the game. She is in a very strong position to where while she does start off pretty slow, she does flip the vote on Tina. And while on the bottom on Kasaya, she's able to build really strong relationships from there and really end up taking a power position by the time of the merge. Again, pick up Aris and Danielle as really solid allies and make the 3-2-1 vote at the final six, which is very impressive. And again, was in a position where Aris probably does take her to the end. The problem is that I think Aris probably beats her. I think it is a very close vote. I do think Aris does have the advantage in that vote to where I think that's an issue. Also, the issue is the fact that I think she also loses to Terry as well if she had gotten to the end with him. And sure, that is just the fundamental issue for me with Sari in comparison to the number one person. The number one person to me has higher jury prospects than Sari does to where Sri on this season, I think, does struggle to win a jury vote against a lot of the people she was in the end game with, where the only person I think she beats is Danielle, who she was even planning on going to the end with. So again, I think for me, that is an issue here. That is one of the major qualms that keeps her out of the number one spot here. As really outside that, obviously, she plays a very impressive, dominant game, one that has her being screwed over at the end. But again, the number one person was also kind of screwed over. So again, that's why I have Sri here, number two. And now number one, the best penultimate juror in Survivor US history is sadly Pascal from Survivor Market cases and I really don't want it to be. Again, I talk about this in my Marquesas retrospective. I don't particularly like Pascal. I do not think he was actually even playing that active of a game. However, he is by far the most screwed over of a penultimate juror here. I mean, he is someone that gets taken out at rocks at four in a situation where this was the first time this had even come up in a situation where even production realized after he got eliminated that this was stupid and that we can't do rocks at four because it doesn't make sense. Again, literally his elimination is the cause for the creation of fire making down the road as they realize how stupid this was to even happen. Now, again, at the end of the day, he still does decide to essentially go to rocks for Nalia, which is an issue here. The fact that he goes into rocks in a position where he, where his side have the worst odds, again, that is actually really dumb. But again, it's a situation that he gets very unfortunate to even be in. Again, if Vesepia did not win immunity at final four, I think they'd more than likely just straight up vote out Vesepia. And has a really clean path to the end. And even if they don't, and Pascal is still someone that was such a likely winner at the end of that point to where had he gotten to the end against Vesepia or Nalia, I think he outright wins handily. I think even against Pathy, I think there's a shot. And really against most of the people on this cast, I mean, by the time the jury faces the game, I think he is one of the biggest jury threats on the board, which is something that, again, really propels him above Suri for me, even though, again, his navigation through the game is not as impressive. So while he was in a decent spot on his original Road to Tribe, he was not in a power position. I mean, he did have a good relationship with John Carroll and had a good relationship with Nalia and Gabe. To where I do think if they had not swapped, I think he probably could have maintained a pretty decent position, though obviously comes to the merge where John Carroll finds other allies and they take out Gabe along the way, putting him in a weaker position, one that he seemed to be resolute in. He seemed to be blindly loyal to the Road 2s until Nalia convinces them to flip at 9, though once that happens, again, he's in a pretty dominant position from that point forward. Now, again, it's not a dominant position that he actively put himself in, which is why I say I I think Suri is a better player than the Pascal, but he still ends up being in a dominant position to where him and Nalia really just end up running a lot of that post-merge game and end up winning the battle at five for Kathy's loyalty, only for him to again get unlucky at how the final four round plays out of them just out of the blue creating this rule about a rock draw that didn't even make sense for it to exist at a final four round. So again, mixing all that with his win equity at the end, again, I do feel like I have to put him at number one. I don't want to. I do obviously want to put Suri, but again, and it's just the fact that Suri didn't have the greatest winning chances and had a rockier early game. Again, I do feel like at the end of the day, I have to go with Pascal here at number one. But there we go. I mean, that is my penultimate juror ranking for Survivor US. Now, you know, probably do the same for Australian Survivor and Survivor SA at some point down the road because I guess that's a tradition I've been doing. Also, beyond this, just expect more big rankings like my ranking of every Big Brother player, which is coming up, which is going to be so long. And just other tips videos you can expect. Again, I'll be updating some of my big Survivor videos for my first year of the channel, like my winner ranking season ranking. So stay tuned for all those things. But for now, that is the video. Thank you.
for watching.